Let's talk about some secret sauce to delete any item. This is going to be very, very simple. It's not going to be as complex as y'all think it may be. And a lot of y'all that have been following me, you know what it is with me. I'm, I'm very straightforward. I like getting to the point. So you're going to see what we're doing. This is very, very simple. What we're going to do, we're going to simply call the credit bureaus. The thing y'all got to understand about credit is that it's basically like, I'm always telling y'all, it's basically like a boxing match. And when I say that, like, you know, the boxing match is uh, 12 rounds. You don't know if it's going to be um, round, whatever, you know what I'm saying, when you when you knock them out. So you just got to keep in mind that, okay, cool. I've sent out my letters. I've done what I've done. Let me figure out how I could add extra pressure. Credit is about adding extra pressure. I could tell, I could tell you to do something. Let's say you name your name Johnny. I tell Sarah to do something else, right? They could both do the same thing. They can get different results. So this is why with credit, not only do you got to stay updated to current tactics and stuff, you know, that's working because the same things that are working now might not work in 2025 and beyond that weren't that wasn't working in like 2022 and all that. So let's get straight to it. That's just a little synopsis, I guess, as far as why I say you should do it. But this is basically how we're gonna approach it. So I just wanted to give y'all the numbers for them. I know we may have some credit repair business owners watching. So just a note for TransUnion, they might ask for the phone number and email that you have on file for your client if you're calling on behalf of your client. So make sure you or your VA has that information available before you even call. These are things that we are aware of within our, um, our own SOPs. So just wanted to give y'all that information for those of y'all that may be credit repair business owners already. So they might ask for the phone number and email of the client too, and then uh, for Equifax, and even a Texas six-digit code for authentication. So make sure you or your VA has the information available and makes the client aware that they may be texted a six-digit code for verification purposes, right? So just, just line of communication is the main thing when it comes to your credit repair business. But let's assume you're doing it for yourself. You know, these are numbers that you can call. The bureaus are always changing their numbers, so... It may be different by the time you watch the video. So, you know, just if it's if it's not the number, don't be a baby about it. Just do research and find a new number. So for each account, this is how I want you to do. Once you call them, you get them on there. You want to make sure that you have your dispute letter in front of you. So physically have it or have it on a computer or something. Have it where you can read it. It's going to make sense as we're going through the video. Have your dispute letter literally in front of you, right? And as far as like the timeline, so my students in my um, 10K mentorship, they already know like how our SOP is structured. So I basically have my team call like maybe seven to 10 days after we sent out the dispute notice. So the reason why we're doing this and why it's powerful, like I said, it's added extra pressure. Sometimes when we just send out the letters, you know, we're quoting all the consumer laws and everything, pointing out the violations, it's going to get deleted. Other times it may need some calling, you know. And I'm not, I'm not talking about calling just about hard inquiries. I'm talking about calling like for accounts as well. This is what we're talking about. So for each account, this is what you want to do once you get someone online. And I'm like, okay, tell me what investigation did you do, right? Because when we talk about, um, for example, 15 USC 1681 IA1A, that's a reinvestigation section. So I'm operating off of the premise that you're using that law. You're asking for a reinvestigation of the information, right? So then you'll ask them, did you look at the information that I sent, which is your letter you have in front of you? And did you compare it to my banking records with what the furnisher said? So for example, let's say you pulled your, your credit reports and you want to be pulling your actual credit reports. What do I mean by that? Do not pull, you know, the identity IQ, smart credit, all that. The credit monitoring is good and you, you can definitely get results that way. But the thing is, if you're going into it with the mindset that you want to sue these people then you have to do it that way with our business with the credit repair business if you're operating that volume i understand that it may be a lot to be you know going to annualcreditreport.com all the time the way that we have our services we have my my team of uh vas a dispute department that does the credit repair on a mass scale if i'm specifically doing somebody's credit it's a higher ticket service because it's you know me using my time to do it i'm going to annualcreditreport.com just to be transparent right because I'm going into it as far as like war, like we're gonna go to war with these people if necessary, you feel me? So 
just keep that in mind. You want to pull your actual credit report from annualcreditreport.com. So you or have your client go ahead and do what they need to do. So you're going to ask them, did you look at the information I sent? Did you compare it to my banking records? So for example, like I said, let's say you have a collection or something or just something that went into negative. You pull your actual credit reports. You look, you analyze the actual credit report. You see the payment history. You see maybe a late payment as 30. You see um, something else that says like no data available. That's considered incomplete. When it comes to uh, the CRA 15 USC 1681I, it doesn't have to just be an item that's inaccurate. It could be something that's incomplete. So that's something to circle and mark as an exhibit of something that's incomplete, right? So they need to go investigate that. So you need to put pressure on them. And the, the fact of the matter is, you know, they use the e-Oscar system. They're just going to give a code. They're not doing no investigation. You can look up case law on that. They're not going to do invest investigation. So our, our whole purpose in calling is we already know they didn't do no investigation. So we're just putting them on the spot to basically like check them as extra um, ammo to use against them, you know? So you can ask them too, did you contact the furnisher? When it comes to bankruptcy, you know, that's, it's, it's not um, the, the core furnishing the information. So you already know you're going to get them in a trap with that. But ask them like, did you contact the furnisher, right? You want to ask them if they say, yes, we did. Did you call them or how did you contact them, right? Like ask the mode of how they contacted. If they on BS, which they typically tend to do, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've experienced the BS with the credit bureaus if you've been disputing. What you're going to do, I want you to tell them, okay, I want you to investigate the account right now. That's why you want to have your letter on the spot with you right now at the moment, right? And you can literally read it to them on the spot. So if they're like, okay, um, they might be trying to play around, not trying to, investigate it on the spot just ask them like why not why can't i do that right you 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 can request the investigation on the phone so once you're able to do it that's when you get into it like okay um let's say discover bank discover bank i'm disputing it because the payment history is off or something right so we're going off of 1681i so we're not even talking about any uh, permissible purpose opt out or anything we're just going based off of inaccuracies or incompletions so let's say discover uh, the payment history is off or something. When they do that reinvestigation, they're supposed to contact Discover, the furnisher. They're supposed to do a reasonable investigation, right? Call them whatever they need to do. If they need to look at banking records, like I said before, whatever is considered a reasonable investigation, which is something that they will never do. This is why we're doing what we're doing, right? So they're supposed to contact them, do a reasonable investigation. And then once they do the reasonable investigation, then they put the information that they got from the furnisher. If Discover has their stuff messed up and they're just like, oh, yeah, just go go report what we told you to report. And then the credit bureaus report it without doing a reasonable investigation. That's where you get them under a 15 U.S.C. 1681I because they didn't do a reasonable investigation. On top of that, too, with uh, the furniture, you can get them under 15 U.S.C. 1681S-2. You can't sue under S-2A. You can sue. You can have a claim under S-2B, B as in boy. That's not legal advice, but, you know, go ahead and um, do your due diligence on that. Okay. So one thing I recommend is you record the conversation to use it as an exhibit. Like, you know, if it goes all the way to court, this is why it's important to do your due diligence and figure out if it's a one party state or a two party state. What do I mean by that? Certain states you can record without the other party's consent and then others it's like two party consent both have to consent to it right so keep that in mind right one little tip too when you're on a call and it says this call may be recorded for whatever purposes you know how to be saying that for training purposes or something so to me it's not legal advice. To me, this is how you interpret it. Um, when they say may, this call may be recorded for training purposes, right? This call may be recorded. So when you keep saying it, this call may be recorded, this call may be recorded, this call may be recorded. Doesn't that let you know they're saying that the call may be recorded? So you can record it, right? Do your own due diligence as far as your state. But when I, when I hear this call may be recorded, that's what that sounds like um, to me, right? 
So that's what that sounds like to me. And one thing that really helped me as far as that specific tip, I was watching, I was watching a video of somebody. He was basically talking about that. Like this, this call may be recorded, you know, for training purposes. So I was like, Oh, that that's true. You know? So I decided to bring it here and uh, pass it along to y'all. So um, I, I thought that was, was, was pretty interesting. So your action item, I want you to call the bureaus after you've disputed properly, right? After you've disputed properly. So using your actual credit reports and, you know, doing what you need to do. And then um, optional, you can join the CAT Credit University if you want more information and to just stay updated on uh, new tactics to delete negative items because, you know, the, the game is always changing. Um, new tactics are always coming out, consumer ammunition tactics, you feel me? But um, you can join for that purpose or you can join just to learn how to start or grow your credit repair business. If you're new to me, I definitely recommend you go to my playlist on my channel. You'll see that I have a lot of uh, students I've helped do some transformational things. Um, and, you know, I've been in the industry for a little bit of time now, like a little bit over three years at this point. So come across certain things. So if you're looking to start your business or grow your business, mentorship is important. I can point you in the right direction. But with that being said, y'all have a blessed one.